My name is Nicole Smith. I am the event and communications uh, coordinator for Spark. Uh, this is uh, one of our weekly webinars and we are so happy to have you join us. Uh, we do these in partnership uh, with the uh, South Niagara Chamber of Commerce, as well as the Niagara Falls Small Business Enterprise Center. So we are thankful for our partners and we are thankful for our presenters. And today we have four amazing presenters from Civic Connect uh, joining us to be able to uh, tell us all about CG CDGSs and how they apply to small business. Um, you will notice you are on mute. Uh, we will remain on mute uh, simply because it just cuts back on the ambient noise while the presenters are presenting. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So I would encourage you to write your questions in the chat box and then um, we'll be able to uh, go from there. And um, yeah, that's, that's all I have from myself. So I will hand it over to Kayleen who will be our first presenter in the team today. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our webinar uh, today on how to incorporate the SDGs into your small business. We're really excited to have all of you here. Norris, slide. Okay, so this is just a brief overview of what we'll talk about today. We're gonna to give a super, super brief intro to the SDGs, then talk about SDGs in your businesses and uh, communicating uh, the SDGs as part of your business. And then we'll do a little bit of questions and wrap up at the end. So Civic Connect is a youth-run nonprofit organization. Um, that's who's presenting the webinar today. We connect youth to their communities, to the private sector, uh, and work with nonprofits to maximize social impact. We do a lot of different consulting work, um, as well as we do a lot of work with local youth to increase civic engagement. Um, and a big focus of our organization um, is achieving the sustainable development goals and engaging all partners in doing that. The team of Civic Connect is Hope, who founded the organization, uh, me, Noor, uh, and Sandra, who's not with us today. And we're very lucky to have an SDG expert, Nico, uh, here presenting with us today, who's also done a lot of work uh, in the SDG sphere, specifically with public health. So these are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, also known as the Global Goals. Uh, they were created by the United Nations in 2015 as an extension to the 2000 Millennium Development Goals, um, which was met with mixed success. Um, but this is a much more comprehensive set of goals to foster sustainability, economic growth and reduce socio, political, cultural and economic inequalities and basically just push society forward by engaging all actors. Um, the important thing to note about the SDGs is that they're all interconnected and you can't really achieve one without achieving the other um, and that everybody needs to be on board for the SDGs um, to be realized. So these are just some of the levels of implementation of the SDGs. Um, as you can see, the SDGs need to be implemented at every single level or every single sphere of society in order to be successful. Uh, the individual impact is important, even though that's often discredited. Household level, local, municipal, provincial, federal, and global. Um, and then within these levels of implementation, there's also different stakeholders. So we have individuals, we have the public sector, we have government actors, um, and then most importantly, what we're going to talk about today is the private sector. And within the private sector, um, we have small businesses, medium businesses, large corporations, uh, all the way up the different sizes of businesses, and each of those different businesses and all of the different actors at all the levels have a role to play. Okay. I'll hand it off to Noor. Thanks, Killian, for the introduction. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about um, SDGs and, and small business um, and like the overarching uh, way that small businesses could implement the SDGs. I'm just going to apologize in advance as we get started. My camera is over here, but my screen's on this side. So if you see me glancing, that's what I'm looking at. I'll try to keep my focus on the camera. All right. So uh, the business case, right? So this is something that we uh, talk about all the time when, when I'm talking to small businesses and small business leaders. Uh, they're always like, okay, well, what's like the SDGs are great and they're and they're nice grandiose goals, uh, but 
but why would I try to implement them for my business? What's the actual business case for implementing SDGs uh, throughout, through, throughout, the, uh, throughout the process of, of, of my small business? So uh, companies are facing challenges that limit their potential to grow, uh, such as uh, scarce national resources, uh, weak financial markets, limited local buying power, and lack of qualified talent. Um, there's a clear business case that harnesses the SDGs to create opportunities to address these challenges across these four key themes that I put up on the screen for you. So growth, risk, capital, and purpose. And I'll, and I'll go into some detail in them uh, over in the next few slides. So firstly, uh, SDGs are a really good way to drive growth. Um, all companies stand to gain from more resilient communities, reliable natural resources, and an educated and healthy population uh, to support their workforce. Um, for example, uh, I, I find this as a, as a good example, um, when beverage companies invest in improved watersheds uh, to um, replenish their aquifer for water use, they are uh, committing to the uh, clean access of uh, water to the communities that, that, uh, that, are, that they are providing, uh, that they are uh, upgrading those aquifers for. But they are sorry about that. But they're also um, but they're also sustaining their bottling practice uh, bottling franchises uh, by improving those watersheds. So they are both improving the community and improving their uh, and improving their business by doing that. Um, by helping drive uh, progress towards those outcomes, they create a shared value. Companies can help secure their abilities to generate capital and shareholder value over the long term by driving growth that helps their communities and themselves. Addressing risk, right? So uh, supply chains in general are particularly exposed to the effects of climate change, depletion of natural resources, um, and a lack of development in some regions, right? So for example, uh, SDGs are a really good way of, of addressing these and, and lots of SDGs over a, a bunch of different um, avenues do address a lot of these key features. So SDGs 12 through 15 are all talking about the depletion of natural resources and climate change. Uh, geopolitical instability in certain regions, that's SDG 16. Uh, inequalities, SDG number 10, and a lack of development in a, in a, in a bunch of different areas are all SDGs one through four. Um, and, and all of those different SDGs uh, ad address these issues, and all of these issues can have negative impacts on, on businesses, no matter the size. Uh, and uh, one thing that I'll talk about when I provide a few resources at the end is uh, there was an investor survey that was conducted, and amongst the top-ranked uh, issues that limit in, in investors from investing in a company, uh, after weak corporate governance, Poor environmental performance and resource scarcity are two of the biggest things that impact in an, uh, whether an investor would invest in a business or not. Um, there are new sources of capital uh, when, you're, when you're talking about the SDGs. Uh, there has been a huge redirection of investment flows, both in the public and private sectors, towards these uh, towards companies that uh, cater to these SDG goals. Uh, we, we saw this initially uh, more heavily on the public side, but uh, the private sector is slowly uh, caught up to what governments have been doing for the last like three to four years. Uh, innovative financial models have emerged as a source of uh, as a successful source of capital for businesses. So uh, climate fi climate financing from government and private sector cash has flowed to projects that focus on SDGs and. Uh, and some, and some type of uh, financial bonds, such as green bonds, uh, have emerged from the private sector as a way of uh, incentivizing uh, businesses to, uh, uh, to generate more capital if they're focused on the SDGs as well. And uh, we, have, uh, we have a purpose, right? So the SDGs can focus a company's purpose uh, on, a, uh, on a series of challenges that are uh, inspiring and um, and, uh, and uh, that are inspiring and innovative uh, to open themselves up to new markets and opportunities. And it's a very good way to future-proof companies uh, for, a, uh, for a ton of issues and risks that may emerge in the, in the long term. Um, for that purpose to resonate um, it, within a company, uh, it, uh, companies need to, be, uh, need, to, need to make a, a 
transformational impact uh, and, and their employees need to be able to see that, right? So it needs to be that like there are, there's a driving force behind that. Uh, and, uh, and SDGs are a really nice way of doing that because people do care about, about a lot of these issues because they impact everybody, right? Uh, and like Kaylin was saying earlier, the, the levels of implementation uh, and, and the range that the SDGs hit are, are literally from the top all the way to the bottom and across all different sizes. So uh, this, this type of purpose within a, within a small business can really ignite that type of passion in, 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 uh, in employees, but also in shareholders, also in investors, right? Like pe investors like to see that. So, okay, that's the business case. Uh, what about actually getting about implementing some of this in, in, into, into a small business, right? Uh, these are some of the five steps uh, that we've identified that are, that are really good ways of, of getting started, right? So step number one, uh, identifying and announcing. Uh, this is a quite a critical step uh, to for companies just getting started in SDGs. Identifying the SDGs that have the biggest impact in terms of risk and opportunity over the long term where the company feels that they can contribute to them is you know, the number one thing that, the, the, that a small business needs to do. Um, and and uh, part of that process would be also uh, trying to measure like what scale they could have as an impact uh, once they've identified those key SDGs. And then uh, the announcing part of this step is actually really important as well. This is a this is what I would say is crucial. But it's a public announcement to uh, you know on social media platforms or 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 on your website or something like that 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 ties you in to. Uh, addressing those goals because if you just internally make a decision to you know we want to achieve these SDGs there's no uh, there's no stake on your behalf to actually follow through whereas once you've made that public announcement people are you know people hear about it people get excited uh, and and uh, that's the step that people are looking for when when they hear that a company has uh, has been working on uh, focusing on some SDGs uh, step number two uh, set some targets and uh, some KPIs uh, the 17 SDG goals are all, uh, so the major goals are all accompanied by these uh, much smaller uh, performance indicators. Uh, and you can find them, there's a list of, uh, I believe it's a list of 160 or something like that. And each SDG is broken down into a bunch of smaller uh, factors. Um, and uh, this, those, those smaller indicators are a really good way to set your company's, uh, company's goals on achieving uh, one of like, within the larger goal, one of the smaller, one of the smaller indicators. And so those are, those would be your targets. And then uh, after you've set your targets, it's good. It's really important to measure your steps towards that target. And those are your key performance indicators. So once we've achieved X, we can move on to achieving the next step and the next step so that you keep on uh, growing and you, you don't stagnate. If you don't measure, you won't know how far you've come. Um, Step number three, aligning existing strategies towards targets. So this is something that I come across all the time where it's kind of like, well, I don't want to uh, restart or go all the way back to the beginning to align myself with the SDGs. Like that's a lot of work. I, I, it, seems, it, seems to be, um, it seems to be not worth the time to do that. Well, actually you, you, you might not need to do that, right? A lot of current business practices uh, could remain the same. You just need to identify if they fall in line with certain SDGs or sometimes they'll only need slight tweaks. And so that's why it's sometimes not as big of a commitment uh, to focus on SDGs as it sometimes may appear. Um, so yeah, aligning existing strategy, aligning existing business practices towards the targets that already, uh, that, you, that you've identified in step one uh, is also a really good way to, to, to work towards some of those SDGs. Step four is collaboration. This is uh, by far one of the most important ones. Um, it's unlikely that a small business will be able to achieve everything they want to achieve by themselves, right? These SDGs aren't silos. Again, I'll refer back to uh, what Kaylin was saying. The levels of implementation are huge and they are, go across sectors and across sizes. And so collaboration is really key. Uh, once you've identified similar goals to other uh, partners or other stakeholders in the, in the region, uh, you can work with them, approach them about perhaps uh, working, on a, uh, working on a specific target together, uh, or, uh, or perhaps they've already taken on uh, some SDG uh, goals and you would like to align yourselves with what their goals are. And so then you guys can work together. 
uh, collaboration within the SDGs is huge and it's, and it's super important to, to getting anything done really. And then finally, uh, step five, evaluate, evaluate, report, inform. Once you've done all everything else and you've started working towards these uh, SDGs, it's really, really important to be able to uh, set up a reporting cycle. Right. So again, you've set up those key performance indicators, but you need to be able to go back, say, okay, we've done this. We've come here. Now we want to report that both to like internally our employees, but uh, also uh, to the public, to, to, to everyone you interact with, to your stakeholders, to your partners. You say like, look, we've come this far. Uh, we have this far to go. Uh, and and uh, these are the steps we're going to be taking from now on. And so setting up a, an, an evaluation uh for yourselves uh, on a monthly, six month, yearly cycle, uh, kind of depends on, on the business is, is super crucial. Uh, and uh, you won't really be seeing the progress that you've made unless, uh, unless that, that has also been implemented. So that's it, that's a really brief overview. I don't wanna take up too much time because we have two other really good speakers coming up. Uh, just one last thing, I'll be copy pasting these links into the chat so everyone can see them, but I did just wanna put them here so I could briefly mention that this, the Business Commission Org is a super helpful resource for any small business trying to get into the SDGs. It's, it's, it's very useful. Um, and then this over here, the third link, is the investor survey that I mentioned. And if you were interested in what the what a what some investors have been saying about these uh, key factors that uh, that make them invest or not, that's also a really good resource. All right, I will uh, hand over the presentation to Nico. Thank you very much, Nor. That was excellent. <laughs> so Nor was talking about a lot of ideas. Uh, about how is the theoretical framework to achieve that, right? But it may not always be easy to define when a company is being green or sustainable, right? So if they were to have a whole bunch of solar panels, for example, is that enough? Are they green now? And, you know, the bottom line is that I often talk to businesses who have achieved you know, some great milestone in one, you know, small factor or aspect of sustainability. Generally, it's energy. So these companies would say, well, we switched everything to LEDs and we have solar panel and we're out of sustainable. But although that's great, it's not quite enough. You know, it's always it seems to be like one of those things that we can never actually reach. We can always keep trying to improve, but it'll never be just for example, energy. There's different factors, social and environmental, other factors uh, that really have to come into play. Uh, Nor, could you? Thank you. So um, the first thing I wanna talk to you about is employees commute and travel. So a lot of companies have em employees, but one of the things that is often over, perhaps goes to over people's heads is the amount of resources spent for employees, especially as your company gets bigger and bigger and you're employing more people uh, to get to work, okay? So for many offices, this is one of the biggest sources of carbon emissions. And in fact, California, the state of California is actually the driving uh, force. It's the largest source of carbon dioxide gas, which is primarily um, there's a big, big, big primary uh, contributor to climate change due to so many people driving uh, in California. Okay. Fortunately, there's many alternatives to minimize this driving, to setting up programs, uh, for example, to incentivize employees to take bikes or public transport or carpool is a really good one. But now as we move into the age of basically staying at home, it's a really good opportunity for telecommuting. Um, so for people to work more from home, um, for example, a couple of days ago, Twitter announced that its employees will be resuming its operations uh, from home and in hashtags uh, forever, uh, meaning that a lot of these companies are moving into kind of a from home kind of standpoint. That not only reduces the cost of emissions and gas, but also reduces the cost and perhaps a family doesn't need two cars anymore, or three cars, you know, maybe one is enough. Uh, because husband and wife go to work uh, once a week at a different, uh, you know, on different days and can share the car. So there's a lot of things that lead up to, it's almost like a ripple effect. <clears throat> community engagement. <clears throat> so having um, your, your community engaged 
um, really has uh, your community engaged. What I mean is the people around the business through your employees, right? It's a really good way to drive the force or really drive the, the meaning behind what you want to strive as a vision for your sustainable practice. So your company may be an X, Y, and Z, but if you were to perform uh, and, and reach those goals in a more sustainable manner that costs a lot less, perhaps that's, you know, uh, something that everybody should be striving for in that company. And oftentimes you have, for example, employees who are largely left out of the loop in decision ideas, um, perhaps that could have benefited or could benefit or lead to benefit for the company. So let's bring our employees on board. Um, one thing that a lot of companies have a hard time dealing with is the idea of hierarchy and structure. You have, you know, uh, people higher up on the proverbial ladder who don't want to talk with people who are lower down. And that kind of animosity creates a really big gap that is very difficult to fill later on. If you're on, uh, if, if you're a leader in your company, for example, and you want to bring your employees on board, it's really important that beyond just uh, commuting and uh, you know decision making, you really encourage them into empowerment by conserving uh, fuel, electricity, paper, water, uh, et cetera. And it's fairly easy to do these things. It's just something that perhaps gets overthought as perhaps not the responsibility of a company owner. Now I wanna give you an example from uh, Walt Disney. So it's committed to sustainability and conservation across a different, uh, several different fronts, right? Starting with the pioneering of basically nature documentaries back with its uh, True Life Adventures series. Today, the company imposes uh, internal carbon um, prices on its business units and has an aggressive 2020 uh, greenhouse reduction goal and celebrates Earth Day in April for the whole month. Um, it's also renowned for its company culture. For those who have been to, for example, Epcot uh, would know it's brought sustainability commitment uh, its sustainability commitment is so powerful um, because of their idea of bringing it back down to the grassroots, its actual employees itself. So for example, for uh, Earth Day, uh, the company encourages employees to conserve fuel, electricity, water, and then celebrates notable achievements uh, to these individuals during that month, uh, which also includes free training, webinars, and other chances to learn more about the environment. So these are things that Walt Disney as a company is really imploring their employees to really learn because once they learn and become aware of how to do things more sustainably, overall, it'll trickle up to the top line, which is that, that business model, right? To really achieve that vision beyond just profit, right? We'll talk about the triple bottom line uh, shortly as well. Office beverages, although it seems pretty redundant. This is one of the ones that I probably learned the most about in the last um, six months or so. We all know that, you know, water bottles perhaps are bad and we should use, right? But how bad are they? I didn't really do an assessment until recently and it's actually really bad. Even if you have recycled water bottles, even if you have, right, it's, it's quite bad. So in an office space, a physical space, you want to have um, you want to get rid of water bottles, for sure get rid of water bottles. There's so many reasons why water needs to be removed from these office spaces. Not only does it encourage the habit of just grabbing a water bottle, which makes employees also want to buy water bottles uh, at home, but there's so much petroleum that gets used into making the plastic uh, that it really needs to be discouraged instead of uh, encouraging it, right? Nobody's going to refuse uh, you know, a glass of water instead of a bottle of water. Okay, much more sustainable, um, less, less plastic, okay? And then the one that I know a lot of us have a really hard time with, me included, I promise, is the K-cups and the Tasmo machines. You know, to manufacture these discs, it requires so many billions of little pieces to be manufactured and shipped uh, of plastic that are often not recycled. So these are some of the key components that can make a really big measurable impact on sustainability for companies just by removing them from the office space and providing alternatives like glasses uh, or, or uh, hydro flasks or whichever, okay? For a business, um, when you have a shared vision with your network or your supply chain, it really does create uh, a sense of uh, 
maybe shared responsibility, whereby one company can minimize the risk because they're not all, you know, they're not taking on the whole responsibility of making everything sustainable themselves. They just align with other people who are also interested in sustainability. And together they form this conglomerate network of sustainable companies all having each other's back. Uh, that's a really effective way to produce sustainable um, results beyond just doing things yourself. So even just following with shared values uh, is amazing. Um, an example, for example, Starbucks brewed up record profits last year, um, obviously in no small part due to its reputation for serving high quality coffee um, that's ethically sourced, um, but it has a long commitment um, of really trying to create an ethical uh, theme to the shop. So it's 99% of its coffee is now ethically sourced, right? Um, as of before, it was about 80 something percent. So now they, they managed to get a 99%, but they didn't create such a big uh, impact on sustainability by themselves. The reason why they're able to sustainably source these things and really push that onto consumers is because they aimed to partner up with uh, producers uh, of coffee beans, right? So they didn't have to twist anybody's arms. Uh, they just simply partner with these vendors that are aligned to that vision. And so this allows the brand to spread that responsibility and again, minimize its risk while again, maximizing its return. Uh, supply chain, we talked a little bit about supply chain, chain, but the idea would be more about raising awareness about the different steps of your supply chain, which can be improved to improve the overall goal of sustainability, right? So are you purchasing products and services, for example, from companies that are also socially and environmentally responsible? Are you more interested in profits, uh, you know, above other things, right? Some of those um, ideas can change when you realize that actually profit margin, right? It, you can make a much higher profit margin when you're taking into account all kinds of other things beyond just, you know, the lowest amount of cost and then sell it for the highest amount of dollar. There's so many other things, you know, fair trade, for example, et cetera, right? That really play into these things, right? So remember that every dollar that you spend as a company is a vote for the company's practice and vision. So make sure you choose wisely. I spent uh, quite a bit of my time doing research, right? But what I mean is the more you research about the topics that you're interested in changing and developing, the more you realize that you don't know enough. And then you continue researching and researching and researching. Um, it's one of those things that seems like a waste of time maybe or a wild goose chase, but there's so many things that you start picking up here and there that you don't realize consciously when you start making decisions later on will help formulate better practices than perhaps you know you would have in the past. Now I want to give you an, an example. Um, McDonald's, for example, another blue chip company, has had sustainable goals in the books uh, since 2014, but they recently announced a partnership to study ways to improve sustainability across the U.S. beef supply chain. So this huge company right, is still going back and spending time doing research, really trying to assess what points of the supply chain can be improved. So the company also announced a $4.5 million incentive to test new grazing practices for, for beef, right, for cows, um, that would actually capture more carbon than is released, okay? The decision comes on top of another 2015 move to cage-free eggs, uh, which has prompted copycat moves across the industry. So it consistently beats profits. So McDonald's consistently beats profit estimates and has pushed its stocks to an all time high as of, you know, before pandemic uh, state, basically. Another one is a certification. So we often undervalue the idea of certifications, but if we really distill down what a certification is, it's a designed program of information and knowledge that you're meant to learn, right? That will have an impact later on. It's like going to school, it's an investment opportunity. These certification programs are not expensive by any means, but the amount of knowledge is really invaluable, even as it just raises awareness. Most of the content perhaps is common knowledge or you may have known before, but different ways to assess and address resources, for example, creates really big differences in the ability for a company to meet 
their sustainability impact goals or not. Okay, so many businesses overlook them, and I'll be happy to speak later with which certifications are, are you know, good or not, but both Green Business Program and B Corps uh, offer great frameworks that any book company can, can really use to learn more about best practices across a wide range of areas, from energy efficiency to community involvement, et cetera. And we can talk more about that uh, later on if anybody's interested. Another one seems super redundant, but really be passionate about what you like, what, what you want, what you want your company to strive for, what it is that you want to synergize with, right, idea-wise. So, for example, I want to illustrate Gap Incorporated, right? So, it, an example from Gap. So, Gap isn't new to sustainability. Um, it set its first greenhouse gas reduction back in 2008, um, six years before McDonald's, right? It committed to reducing its emissions uh, by 20%. Uh, by 2015, um, and it actually nearly doubled it. It, it reduced it by about 37%. Um, it might seem strange, you know, after surpassing that, that the CEO of uh, Gap, his name is Art Peck, uh, published a letter in 2016 saying that, frankly, I'm not satisfied where the apparel industry, including Gap Incorporated, is today on a variety of social and environmental issues. Okay, well, you know, that's, that's one way to, to raise awareness, but Peck wasn't just venting. He was creating a movement. Uh, you know, the letter went on to announce a litany of gap incentives aimed at improving the environment and labor conditions throughout the company and its supply chain. So Noor, for example, talked a little bit about you know, what it means to raise awareness, what it means to, to, to really create that sense of commitment where you're telling the public, listen, this company is actually gonna do this. And it really creates kind of a, a responsibility then to commit, right? And that really helps companies push forward through those, throughout uh, those incentives. It's a really good uh, tool to use. Giving back is another one that really often gets disregarded as perhaps you know, too altruistic, uh, et cetera. But as companies look to implement the triple bottom line, they need to pay uh, increasing attention to not just uh, their environmental impact, but also the social impact. So one of the best ways to have a positive uh, social impact is to engage employees and is to implement a community service policy that allows your company to give back to local communities. It literally means if you're giving back and others feel and see that you're giving back, it creates a support network of trust and really trust, just like in a relationship is one of the founding principles of perhaps success, uh, a company as well is on that same boat. Uh, trust with consumers is extremely important to ascertain that value, that market value that you're striving for. So business model, we talked a little bit about the business model of creating theoretical frameworks and Noor talked a lot about business models in the sense of creating a plan, a step plan by which you compartmentalizing the steps required or the milestones required to reach a further goal. So you achieve one thing and then from there move on to the next, move on to the next. And honestly, that is uh, scientifically proven to be the best model. Sometimes people get overwhelmed with too many sustainable development things that I have to worry about. I have to remove the water bottles, plus I have to commute the car, you know, and, I, and it's too much. So one step at a time, honestly, it's okay if, for example, you start incentivizing employees to reduce gas or whatever, you know, and in the meantime, you're still using water bottles. Uh, and then in a month from now, you, you know, remove water bottles. It, it's okay to move in these steps. Uh, a lot of people get the sense that, oh, I'm hyper hy hypocritical right? I am doing this, but I'm also doing that. Well, it's, it's a growing process. It's, it really is a growing process. You don't want to be paralyzed by being overwhelmed because then nothing actually gets done. So it's a really good way to really assess your progress. And I think that's really important. So accept that you're going to have to start somewhere. So be easy on yourself. Don't think it as hypo uh, hypocritical, uh, for example. And I really want to illustrate a, another company, Walmart, 
Um, when the then Walmart CEO, Lee Scott, first announced that the company's sustainable efforts in 2005, he caught some flack from sustainability advocates because he didn't have firm targets behind him. Um, there's no timeline really, but the company went on to record expressing a goal to use 100% renewable energy and produce zero waste and sell products to sustain people and the environment. Walmart continued to refine that commitment and put firm numbers behind it later on. So in 2010, for example, leadership set a goal of cutting 20 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions from its global supply chain. And by 2015, it had cut 28.2 million tons, in part by doubling the fuel efficiency of its vehicle fleet. Okay, so small little changes lead to big impact. Okay, the measures, these measures, so we're talking about, you know, cost, 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 but how much revenue did it create? Well, these measures actually saved the company $1 billion in the next five years. So that's $200 million a year in extra, I guess, profit or, or gross margin, uh, less waste. Um, and that are, these are changes that are, you know, for future, right? So in, in the future also, you will also have uh, these savings as well. So it really are investments uh, that help propagate the success of your company. Tracking and metrics, uh, and we'll actually move on one more slide. Banking. Okay, so tracking and metrics and banking are kind of similar. Um, does your company bank with a corporate bank on Wall Street, for example, or a local community-focused bank? Um, sometimes it's, there, there are no alternatives in the community, but a local bank will tend to have a higher social standards since they're members of the local community, as well as uh, you know, keeping your money local will really help that local economy. So remember about giving back to your, economy, to your you know, community, et cetera. Um, and then if, if you guys you know, want to talk about the B impact assessment, it really raises your points for the B impact assessment as well. We can get more into this uh, later on for those who are interested. But lastly, I want to talk about how inevitable it is. So scientifically, we're moving into an era where resources are you know, dwindling and our population is you know, over encumbering on the earth. Sustainability is, is going to be a practice that you're going to see more and more and more of. Because it's inevitable, it's better to start first. Those who start first uh, end up making the most uh, progress or impact from what they are uh, trying to achieve. So all these, all, all businesses are forward facing, right? And they prepare for, uh, you know, the needs of today, but also the needs of tomorrow. A lot of research is going into what consumers want. And it really, really keeps addressing, keep supporting the notion that consumers already want to purchase sustainably. This is something that you don't have to convince them of. Um, it's already done. You just have to provide them with the resources for them to be sustainable. And they already know the impact. Okay. Um, that trend is only intensifying. So, you know, with all that said, uh, start thinking about little things you can do, um, because this is something that you're going to see a lot more of the future. Thank you. I'm going to pass on the the, uh, the speaker to Pope, I believe. Yes, uh, thank you, Nura and Nico, for your really, really insightful pieces on sustainable practices that's led to this point. Um, what I'd like to do is reiterate the importance of effectively communicating your work, the work that you're doing with the SDGs. Um, Nora did a great job of touching on partnerships. I'll briefly go over uh, digital marketing and how to nail down your public relations in that sense. Slide. Next slide. No. Um, so as Noor previously explained, the importance of partnerships and how we, one, small business is unlikely to tackle um, all the SDGs at once or possibly not in the scale that they're hoping for. So a great opportunity is to collaborate on a project or initiative or to have a grassroots organization or larger organizations who's really figured out how to make these SDGs work with business, work alongside you. Um, this will not only increase the sustainability of your company by jumping on board with another, but you'll also be able to reach wider audiences and new clients through both of your shared networks. Um, next slide. An example of this is by Levi Jeans in the project Waterless. Um, they realized how detrimental the production of clothing is to the environment and how um, to make one pair of jeans takes about 42 liters of water. 
So instead of bringing on new staff and new scientists to redesign the way they create genes, they partnered with this organization called Waterless. Um, and this has been so successful that more than half of their genes come from this organization's um, design. And it's really made people more proud to say, I wear Levi jeans and I wear something that is sustainable. Next slide. So next, um, after you've gone through Nora Nico's advice and figured out how you'd like to realign your business strategy and practices and visions with the SDGs, what's so important is making sure you're clearly communicating that in your digital marketing. Um, as Nico explained, you don't have to convince so many people to want to buy sustainable. It's already happened. A recent study from Accenture shows that more than 50% of people would pay more for sustainable products and services, and 73 currently do and buy products that are more environmentally friendly than they did five years ago. So when you're considering communicating to your clients, your stakeholders, your customers, what you're doing, consider what actions are you taking to achieve this goal? How is your target group being affected by it? And how can customers be a part of that change by supporting the business? Why are people more compelled to buy jeans at Levi's than American Eagle? It's through because they know they can have a better environmental impact going with Project Waterless. Next slide. The next example here is a actual local small business who is a member at Spark. They are a virtual reality company. Um, they're focused on creating virtual reality simulations primarily for research. Um, and their motto is bringing imaginations to life. While they're doing lots of fantastic work in research, they are innovating, expanding technological opportunities. Some things that they can better communicate in their digital marketing are how their innovative technologies are increasing the sustainability of new communities, how they are expanding geographic reach of research, promoting innovation, um, using standards that ensure company projects and initiatives are sustainable, and also collab uh, highlight the collaborations they have with NGOs, other research institutions, and more. And we're going to go to our last topic is public relations. This is so important, not only for the growth of your business, but the growth of your cause to communicate your sustainable impact with stakeholders. Um, and as obviously, it will make a compelling grant application um, as we go back to the new normal and um, business grants and loans will be even more scarce if you can make a compelling case that by having an angel investor choose you, they're not only investing in your business, but in a much greater cause. That's really going to make you stand out from the rest and try to attract more community and clients towards um, a movement in the SDGs that you are uh, creating. Um, and lastly, along that same line, by sharing the work you're doing with SDGs, you will be growing your community uh, locally, business networks, um, other professional networks that you're a part of to join you on that cause that you and your business are passionate about. Um, and I believe that wraps our presentation up for now. We have a few minutes that we'd love to hear your questions or um, touch on any things that you'd like to hear more about. Great. That's, that's, wow. That's so much information. Uh, yes. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and uh, write them up in your, uh, in the chat box here. Um, this has been uh, incredibly educational. And uh, um, so I just, uh, I guess a, a question that I have is in with the COVID-19 thing and going back to work thing, um, how do you think this is going to impact some of the sustainability practices that have been recommended, such as, you know, commuting, because uh, unless you have a really big vehicle, you can't be six, really six feet apart from each other, um, you know, uh, using cups um, instead of, of, you know, disposable stuff. Uh, you know, w w what, um, what do you think, uh, what do you think the impact of COVID-19 is going to have on all of this? Anybody? That's a great question. I, I love that question. Um, <clears throat> I'm always the type of person, I think, to think of things in a positive light. So although the, this COVID-19 pandemic has been 
uh, horrible, I guess, in some senses, right? It's really, really helped us uh, as a human race, I guess, if that makes sense. It really pushed the idea that health and sanitation is, uh, you know, super important. Um, but from a sustainability business suspense uh, uh, perspective, it's really going to push the stay at home type of mentality. And I think that, you know, in the early stages in Wuhan, when the COVID-19 was happening and, uh, you know, they were all forced into lockdown into their homes and stuff, um, NASA released some pictures of, uh, you know, the earth, obviously, but what I mean is on Wuhan. And you can see that the amount of climate change damage caused by all the carbon dioxide and smoke had reduced to about 20% of what it was, almost to zero. It almost kind of gave the earth a breathing space, if that makes sense. So I think the COVID-19 um, is really going to be the frontier of pushing people to not travel so much. Um, I really hope that from this, the you know, we're going to stem into more people working at home, um, you know, uh, more, uh, so less carbon tax, less carbon emissions, less gasoline. Um, it's going to increase, increase the uh, value of electric cars. You're only going to work once or twice a week, for example. That's a really good movement sustainability wise. Um, I, I think there's a lot of good potential and there's a lot of directions that this COVID can, can take. I think business wise, it's, you know, monumental, um, kind of monumental push. Um, but so uh, I'd like to hear from my other colleagues. Um, so, yeah, so in addition to everything Nico said, I think one of the, <laughs> this is going to be funny, one of the big things on businesses that uh, COVID is going to uh, change is I think we're going to see a really drastic uh, decrease in uh, handshakes. And if you think about how crucial handshakes are uh, when you're actually interacting with someone new, uh, like all of, of Western culture involves like coming up to a person, putting out your hand, shaking, and there's so many interpretations of what that handshake means and how you approach a meeting with someone like that for the first time. Um, and I think that is actually going to be the biggest <laughs> impact on businesses after COVID, <laughs> uh, after obviously recovering from the supply chain issues and all of that. But really, it's those interpersonal uh, contacts that's going to be the, uh, the, the biggest change up, I, I believe, at least. Um, I... Oh. Cool. I was going to say nobody's going to spit in their hands and say <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> um, I think as well, COVID has really clearly illustrated um, how important the private sector is in sustainable development. Um, I know there's a lot of offloading that happens between the private sector or large companies to small companies and the private sector to the public sector to individuals. Um, and the data has shown that it's not individuals that are households that are the cause of mass environmental degradation, resource depletion, it's pollution, et cetera. It is actually those corporations. And we've seen that um, because when corporations shut down, we've seen the impact versus, you, you know, like just looking at hydro rates in Ontario, it's very clear the bulk of hydro consumption is coming from um, corporations. So it's made the private sector have an even more important role. Um, and it's made individuals want the private sector to be more accountable, which is a good thing, but that means a little bit more work and a little bit of innovation for businesses. Um, I'll touch in and follow up on that as well. I think a really positive thing that will come of the situation and the way moving forward is the way that businesses have been pressured to make all of well, most of their services and products more accessible in virtual ways. Um, no longer are we expected, I, I hope, will we be expected to drive to Toronto to a meeting or drive four hours for a certain conference or being in remote communities be a barrier to accessing different educational business opportunities. I think that this will have a great impact on, as Nico mentioned previously, reducing our carbon footprint and reducing travel um, and really seeing the possibilities of expanding um, very urban center opportunities, businesses, ideas to all of uh, nations in the world. Yeah, uh, another last thing I wanted to say is there's a lot of things that also will go um, perhaps unrealized. Like if you have a world, let's say in theory that everybody's working at home and you have a family, a mother and father who are both working you know, from home or whatever, you now kind of have a mandatory ma uh, paternity and maternity leave. 
where you have both parents actually taking care of a child, if a newborn child, because either, even though the father perhaps has to be working, um, you know, has a lunch break or whatever, can help, can be here, can be there, right? So it's going to really, uh, you know, improve, I think, the quality of life of families. It definitely improved the quality of life of all dogs, because um, now everybody's at home playing with their dogs. But it definitely has a really big potential to improve a lot of quality of life. It just, it's a matter of, are, is the human race ready to take that next step, to take this as a learning opportunity and move on or not? So to digress back to your question, you know, how will COVID impact stuff? I think it depends on, you know, people's idea of how they want to proceed from here. They want to go back to the old norms, kind of, which I don't see happening, or we want to move into a more, uh, you know, electronic world, I guess. As I see that Salome has a question. So if you want to unmute yourself, okay. Um, my question, I own a youth hostel for backpackers. So we are talking about traveling for work, but here in Niagara Falls, most of us, the community, rely in tourism and people coming from abroad. So I think uh, the most important thing to, to take from the goals is that it's education. We have to change. Our behavior is not good for our environment and, and COVID-19 is just a reflection of that. So we have to change and that's through education and uh, public health services. Here in Canada, we go for, uh, to a doctor because we are sick, not because we don't want to be sick. So that's also part of the modification that we have to do in our daily behavior. And tourism industry has, has to change. It's not just marketing, 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 and come, 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 and less price because, and you will have more. No, we have value. We have to protect that value and we have to know how to sell what we are. And we start to with at home with our community. So we have to teach our community how to behave. And we see that around us. We neglect our environment as a community. We have very nice services close to the tourism area. But after that, it's neglected. And that's a reflection of what we are, really what we are. And we have to change. And if we have a healthy community, we will be more in charge to control spread viruses, but also to keep our environment healthy. So I think the association of commerce and everybody have to work together and that's sustainability. How to have those programs, educational programs to work together and benefit everybody. Otherwise, it will be a lot, lot, lot waste of money and we will still be sick and businesses are will go as it is now. So, I think we have to ask from our government, federal, provincial, and local, what are the procedures to work with our community, to enjoy our environment, to protect our environment and be healthy. And I'm, I'm eager to participate on that. Our mission at the hostel is not provide a cheap accommodation. And that's, that cost me a lot. Mm -hmm. During six years, I was trying to show this is not a cheap, uh, it's not for everybody. It's for youth people that know how to behave, respect and enjoy the place they are visiting and leave it better for others. So if we don't do that, we will be just in bankruptcy. And COVID-19 is just a reflection. This is a great opportunity that we have to work together to educate our community, social and businesses work together for a healthy environment. 
my few cents and my hostel is available for that. I, I close it because I don't want to contribute with the spread. Well, we're I'm losing money, yes, but I think I lose, I'm losing the less if I still be open with people without procedures, yep. without protection. No, I have to be prepared to protect my community inside, my staff, to protect my community around here, and then be ready to protect my travelers. Okay, and well, them. well, we definitely, yes, absolutely agree. Thank you so much. And this is, this is it. We are at almost one o'clock. I want to say thank you again to all of our presenters today for doing such an amazing job. And I want to thank everybody uh, who attended. We do these every week. Uh, next week, we'll be doing one on uh, intellectual properties at one o'clock. So if that's of interest to you, um, and this is intellectual properties in this COVID uh, situation. So register for that. Fridays, we do what's called FICA Fridays. We are starting a pay it forward uh, aspect to that starting uh, tomorrow. So while we FICA, which means we meet for coffee and network online, um, we are also going to be making uh, a drop off to some of our frontline workers in thankfulness for everything they're doing. So if you're interested in doing, joining us, uh, again, register online, go to our Facebook, and this session will be on our YouTube channel, so uh, check it out there, and uh, thank you again so much. Everybody have yourselves a great day.